Welcome back to part two of our SWIM Leadership Series training on the Supernatural Church. My name is J.P. Greer. I'm the International Director and the founder for Sentinels for Christ. If you remember, in our first message on this training, we introduced you three key concepts. First, we introduced you the teaching regarding cessationism. Cessationism is the belief that as the Bible was put together in its final form, that the need for the Holy Spirit to demonstrate credibility to the church and credibility for God's witnesses through signs and wonders seized or diminished and that that was replaced by the written word of God. We also informed you that roughly three quarters of people in Christendom throughout the world are taught this teaching and that most leaders and most pastors who go to seminary and go to schools and learn how to lead and how to be a pastor are introduced to the doctrine of cessationism and told that that is a credible church doctrine, okay? We at Sentinels for Christ do not adhere to that belief and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that later about the how and why of that. But we also introduced you the primary teachers of cessationism so that you'd be able to recognize where it came from and on a historical timeline when it seemed to gain momentum. But probably the most important thing that we introduced to you in the first segment was we explained that the teaching regarding cessationism and how it affects the church today is really attached to the ancient argument and discussion regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the confusion between the two. So I want to state for clarity purposes right before we start this second segment that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an individual relationship experience that happens with God the Father through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit when they become saved and when they decide to cooperate with God's power in their life. That is only part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is a much broader form of the governance of God, the supernatural work of the kingdom, as it does the work on the expansion of the kingdom of God over planet Earth. If you confuse the two, <laughs> you're going to be confused in your ministry. We don't want you to do that. But part of what will occur at the end of this training on this section is we're going to ask you to go into the book of Acts and develop your own belief system and faith system regarding what you believe is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because even if you don't have all the answers, what you do need to have is an accurate credible belief system based on what you believe Holy Spirit is teaching you to do, and we trust that God will build on that so that you are effective in your ministries. Before we go on, I want to take a couple minutes just to talk about a truth principle when it comes to studying this book, The Word of God, that's going to help you in your ministry as a leader, certainly in your ministry as a teacher, and even in your own devotional time, okay? And this is the difference between what is inferred truth versus determinative truth. What do I mean by that? Inferred truth is a truth principle that is given to us from the Word of God by which we are to take it, and underneath the guidance of the Holy Spirit, apply it broad-based across all aspects of our life. It may affect relationships, it may affect our behavior, it may affect many different things, and even the culture and the time period that we are in may affect how we apply an inferred truth, okay? A determinative truth, on the other hand, is a spiritual truth principle that regardless of time, regardless of circumstance, it means the same thing. We would say in an English term that it is as clear as black is over white, okay? Let me give you an example from the New Testament so that this will help you. In the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians, where Paul is talking at length about marriage, he has a lot of things to say about marriage. But in the 39th verse, the closing verses of that chapter, he says the following regarding women who have lost their husbands. Their husbands have died and they're now widows. He says, it is okay if they remarry again. However, 
the person that they remarry must be in the Lord. That is a determinative truth, meaning if that woman remarries, the person that she remarries must be a Christian, not someone who is seeking Christianity, not someone who is tolerant of them going to church, or not someone that they think that Jesus is going to be a nice guy, but it is someone who's in the Lord. And I know by using that as an example of determinative truth, I just possibly ruffled some feathers, but I'm going to save a ton of you women heartbreak if you will receive that the way that that's meant to be received. I bless you in Jesus' name. Let's talk about an example of inferred truth. In the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Paul says the following as he's wrapping up this letter. He says, bad company corrupts good character. What does he mean by that? Well, the inferred truth is that the type of people that we hang around, if they're not Christians, and if they have bad morals, bad behavior, bad company, they will corrupt by proximity, by hanging around with them, our good character, okay? So in that inferred truth, we have the freedom to decide how much we might hang around someone because we might want to witness to someone who doesn't know the Lord because, hey, if people didn't reach out to people who didn't know the Lord, they're not going to hear the gospel anyways. And most of us prior to knowing Jesus, we had what? bad, corrupt character, okay? But it also means that we can go too far in hanging around someone and actually have our own behavior and spirit and emotional self corrupted by our proximity to them. It also means the following. There may be two Christians. They may know the same person. The person that they know, they may both conclude that, wow, that guy has really corrupt character right now. One of those Christians may say, I'm not going to spend any time with that individual because they sincerely believe that spending time with them will corrupt their character, may get them out of their lane of what they're supposed to do in the ministry, and may lead them into a behavioral zone of potential sin um, that they don't want to get involved in. Another person may believe that that's not the case, that they may hang around that person or spend time with that person for purposes of ministering to them for the sake of the gospel, okay? So inferred truth can be perceived and applied by different people in different ways. It's really important you understand that as a leader because if you don't understand that when you're reading this book, you may make the mistake of taking inferred truths and saying that they're determinative truths when they're not. And secondly, when you're teaching, you may teach something as a determinative truth, which has no flexibility when it's inferred truth. I am going to save you as a teacher and minister of the word of gospel if you receive this message. But why is it important to the supernatural church? Here's why. The whole theology of cessationism from beginning to end is based on inferred truth. Okay? Observed by the church early leaders after the end of the first century, roughly actually between the second and third centuries, who noticed the work of the Holy Spirit was starting evidently to diminish in signs and wonders. It is mission critical you understand that in the ministry of the Holy Spirit that cessationism is an inferred truth. Nowhere in the writings of this book, Old Testament or New, is there a determinative truth statement that says the work of the Holy Spirit through the supernatural or signs and wonders as we know it will diminish at any point in history. Nowhere in the writings of the New Testament, amongst the writings of Paul, Peter, and John, the primary pillars of the faith who are responsible for writing over half of the New Testament, do they indicate that the ministry of the Holy Spirit will diminish and that the Word of God will replace that. That is an inferred truth that was brought about by the teachings and doctrines of men. If we consider this book as the ultimate authority and we consider Jesus the ultimate shepherd, I want you to consider what he says in the 16th chapter of Mark. My followers will do the following. They will manifest these signs. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will be healed. They will resurrect those from the dead. They will cast out demons. They will speak in tongues. And that is not an exhaustive list of what Jesus says his followers will do. I will take as a Christian the words of Jesus as the determinative 
authority over what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to look like in the world over the ideas of men, even the best intentions of man. But I want to remind you, we're not being divisive. We do not want you to be divisive. There is no doubt that when God put together this ultimate testimony that we know is the Bible today, that this isn't just the word of God, but behind this is mighty spiritual power, which is endowed through the work of the Holy Spirit. And working together, the Holy Spirit, using this word written in its form, in its truth, and its knowledge, and in the power of the Holy Spirit through signs and wonders, is the kingdom of God meant to march forward. That's what we believe at Sentinels for Christ. Now, in our next section, we're going to be taking a look primarily at the next six chapters of the book of Acts. We're going to point out some commonalities that happen or reoccurring themes that happen so that we can reinforce the idea of what the Bible presents as the model for the church throughout time. So now we're going to talk about three mandatory elements that have to be part of a movement of the Holy Spirit or the work of the assembly of the church in the region or the community. And those elements are waiting, the spirit of koinonia, and the inescapable witness of church growth. So the first necessary supernatural element is the element of waiting and what do we mean when we talk about waiting we're talking about waiting on the holy spirit if you read the book of acts with any type of intelligence any type of authenticity you will not miss this aspect of the ministry of god's people and the expansion of the kingdom of god through the book of acts okay now when God's people today, and even in the book of Acts, get to the point where human circumstances make it very difficult to wait on the direction of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit steps in, either in person or directly in the form of Jesus, and there is an interaction and a reality where the Holy Spirit and Jesus interact together, yet are one, yet are separate. It's part of our faith that we believe in a triune God that surpasses our knowledge, but we're talking about the same thing. Jesus commanding his church through the promise of the Father, Holy Spirit, okay? Acts, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3.17 tells us that the Lord is the Spirit. That word there is capitalized. It's the same Spirit that means Holy Spirit, okay? So you don't want to be confused about that. So in the examples that we give, all right, it's Holy Spirit that is directing the church, okay? Acts is a book which teaches us to wait on the direction of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the church. And what do we see in the very first chapter of Acts happening? Jesus commanding the church to wait until you have power on high, the gift of the Father, before you become witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth. And in verses 8 through 14, we find the church, a group of about 120 believers at that time. They're waiting in the upper room together. They're in one mind, one accord, and they're praying, and they are obediently waiting for the direction of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost comes in chapter 2, and things take off. But in Acts chapter 10, Peter is told by the Holy Spirit through a vision to go with these men when Cornelius' assistants come, and that results in the gospel being formally given to the Gentile church. In the 13th chapter of Acts, a major transition point as well, when the gospel is, is sent outside of modern-day Palestine to the Gentile world. In Acts 13, 1, Paul, Barnabas, and, and three other elders are praying and fasting, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And it's through that waiting and, and seeking Holy Spirit's guidance that Holy Spirit says to that group of men, okay, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. Did you notice the Holy Spirit did not say set aside Paul, Barnabas, and Mark? It's just something for you to think about. It said set aside Paul and Barnabas. In Acts chapter 16, the decision to head into Macedonia is a spirit 
led decision. Paul and his companions wanted to go north into northern Turkey, and the Holy Spirit sent a vision, okay, while at the same time prohibiting Paul and his traveling partners from going into northern Turkey. The result was the gospel goes to Philippi under the direction of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 18, things must have been bad, okay, because when Paul gets to Corinth, there is a lot of opposition there. But the, but Jesus shows up and in the guidance of Holy Spirit, okay, again, tells Paul, relax. I have many people in here, in this city. You're safe. Keep preaching. Paul continues to do the work that he was called to do in Corinth for a year and a half. In chapter 23, the direction and encouragement of Paul when he got arrested, arrested in Jerusalem, and it was looking like things, the whole plan had gone awry. He must have been panicking at that time. At that time, Jesus shows up, tells Paul, Paul, relax. Just as you've testified before me before other kings, you're going to testify before me in Rome as well. And in Acts chapter 27, okay, again, when Paul was discouraged, things look like they cannot go any worse. Where is God taking this mess? The Spirit evidently showed up to Paul is his testimony through the form of an angel or the Spirit directing the angel to tell Paul, hey, you and your companions are going to be okay. You're going to get shipwrecked, but it's going to be okay. You cannot miss in the book of Acts this issue of waiting on the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the most difficult things I think to do is for a Christian to learn to hear from the Holy Spirit. And here's why. We are, we are encased in flesh bodies. And those are entangled with our emotion. And what cries out louder than anything else is the flesh man and the emotional man over the spirit man. And it takes the Holy Spirit living within us to start to fine tune our spirit, okay? To start to listen and have fellowship with his spirit. This is why in the second chapter of Corinthians, it makes it clear that the fleshly man cannot hear from the spirit. In fact, things of the spirit seem crazy to him, okay? I would present to you that there are a lot of flesh Christians running around the church, not hearing the Spirit, and getting involved in things that they should not be involved in. One of the things that we teach at Sentinels for Christ is our effectiveness in our area will expand rapidly and grow largely if we learn to be patient and listen to the Spirit. Let me tell you something else, friends. You know what else it will be? It'll be full of a lot more joy, no matter how rough the time comes, and it will be full of a lot more spirit-filled fruit as far as flesh fruit. So if you don't have this element of waiting as part of your ministry or part of your assembly, it's something you will need to cultivate. Let's talk about the second aspect of a supernatural church. Accord. What is this word called accord in your English versions of your Bible? Okay. When we talk about accord, we're talking about a word in the Greek that is known as koinonia. Okay. And it occurs in the New Testament some 19 different times. Okay. And koinonia refers to a communion or a, a participation in, which is intimate, specifically between believers of the Christian faith. Koinonia is what happens when the Holy Spirit is the glue that holds people together. When koinonia is not there, you will have all sorts of division. All of the things that are mentioned in the fifth chapter of uh, Galatians, when it talks about the works of the flesh, these things will occur when koinonia is not in place. The supernatural church is specifically, okay, highlighted by this issue of koinonia. In fact, this is the witness that Jesus is talking about in John 13, 35, when he says, they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. The inference is a koinonia type relationship with each other that's supernatural and is something that is not of the earth. And we will see as we go through this short section, just how koinonia is played out and emphasized in the New Testament. But I want you to realize something in the book of Acts, that when something is repeated, when there is a theme that is repeated, okay, or, or a circumstance that is repeated, that is highlighted, that it is the Holy Spirit bringing out an emphasis on that truth so that we understand that, hey, 
This is important. And this issue of koinonia or of one accord is a major issue that is a key component of the supernatural church. And without it, you will not have a supernatural church. You will not have works of this of the Holy Spirit occurring because the Holy Spirit cannot manifest himself in an atmosphere where there is division, strife, selfishness, and works of the flesh um, taking precedence. One of the main ways that works of the flesh take place in the church, okay? I'm going to give you a freebie right here and manifest more chaos, more division, get more people distracted is the issue of money. And when Paul writes that the love of money is, is the root of all evil, he is not kidding. It is money and the focus on mammon that will destroy koinonia faster than anything else. Let me tell you something at Sentinels for Christ more than often. I have had to deal with it. There are times even in, the, in presently when we are dealing with an issue where this has caused a, 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 a diversion in the ministry. We deal with it, okay? Koinonia. Okay, it's really important. Now, in the first six chapters of the book of Acts, because you remember we're using the first six chapters as the model for the church, this aspect of being in one accord in a koinoniac faith with each other is mentioned five different times. Probably the most remarkable time when the actual Greek word of koinonia is used is in the second chapter, all right, from verses, uh, chapter two, verses uh, 42 through 46, where it is referring to this relationship between the new church. Remember, Peter has, has given his first sermon. The church has exploded. Now there's 3,000 members. They are continuing together, learning and breaking bread and focusing on the teaching of the apostles. That's Koinonia. But even prior to that, in the first chapter, okay, this common one accord, okay, without division is occurring in the upper room when it says they were of one accord, okay? As we move forward in these early chapters of the book of Acts, we also see in, in chapter 4, verse 32. Now remember what's happened in chapter 4. Peter's given his first two sermons and the church has exploded up to a minimum of, of 5,000 people. But also, the church has begun to be heavily persecuted by the Jewish authorities. And it's after this second persecution, okay, that we are again reminded by the writer Luke of the book of Acts that the believers, despite persecution, are still operating in one accord with each other, sharing and having intimate koinonia. This goes in until the advent of chapter 5 and verse 12, where the, the final persecution has happened from the religious rulers of that time, and the church is still functioning, it's still growing. It, uh, verse 14 says that men and women are still coming to the faith and believing, and the church is increasing. The atmosphere of this group of Christians is so remarkable that the writer of Acts tells us that even amongst the people who weren't Christians, the Christians and the way they lived were in high regard with the people. Now let me ask you something, believer, right now where you're sitting today. Is your church held in high regard in your community? Or is it known as a place that causes division and fights? and scandals, and moral failures amongst the leadership? Is it a place that reaches out to the community and touches people's lives, possibly through material resources? Is it known as that group of people who are set off and, and untouchable and we really don't know what is going on? Or is your church assembly so visible that people see the love that exists, the koinonia that takes place between each one of you and you're held in high regard? It's something to think about because if you haven't cultivated that, if that is not the atmosphere of your church, that's your starting point. Because if your interactions with each other are not developed to a point of promoting this Holy Spirit empowered koinonia, you are not ready to go out into the world, okay? That's why this aspect of one accord is emphasized so many times in the first few chapters of the book of Acts. But when it also says one accord, it's talking about there is a common goal or a common theme or a common mission, which is quite often not the main emphasis of the church. 
And we're going to talk about what that mission is in our next teaching series on the Supernatural Church, Part 3.